Hi, my mic is not working, and Gloria's gonna need that too. So, as she said, my name is Lovey, and I'm really excited to be the moderator of this amazing panel. And she called me a rock star, but what do you call me a rock star when you're on a panel with these incredible people, okay? So it's like, I don't know what we, what's higher than rock star? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Icons, I think that's it. yes, <laughs> trailblazers, change makers, change agents on this panel. So I'm excited to have this conversation. Our purpose here in talking about advancing media and opportunity in media is to really have this conversation on highlighting how trailblazers are using their leadership and influence to promote increased access to opportunity, reduce barriers, and generate stories that defy negative stereotypes. Two. I want to raise awareness here of unconscious bias and its impacts on hiring practices and storytelling. Three, provide a voice for the voiceless. And four, launch an industry-led initiatives designed to accelerate the pace of change. We need to not just talk, we need to act. So on this panel, we will be having the conversations about what we're currently doing, what we should be doing, and what diversity even means. So I'm going to have these amazing panelists introduce themselves, and we're going to go down the line. First, we have Gloria Steinem. Gloria, what do you got? Oh, there we go. So I, I start all of this off? Or Kick it off. Why not? <laughs> You're not going to ask me a question? No. <laughs> Tell the people who you are, Gloria. <laughs> OK. Nah. Uh, my name is Gloria Steinem, and I am a writer and organizer, and uh, with great pride, I say I get to do what I love the most every day of my life, and I thank you all for that. Gloria is one of the original professional troublemakers. <laughs> <laughs> and next we have Amani. Uh, Amani here, junior troublemaker. <laughs> uh, I am the founder and editor-in-chief of MuslimGirl.com, the most read Muslim women's blog in the country. We became the first Muslim company to land on the Forbes 30 under 30 list this year. We have web shows and mainstream publications like Teen Vogue and MTV. And what we're trying to do is amplify the voices of Muslim women and create a platform for them to push back in mainstream media. And next we have Shonda Rhimes. Um, I'm Shonda. <laughs> Turn up. <laughs> I'm Shonda Rhimes. I'm a content creator. I make television. <laughs> she, she's like, I make television. <laughs> Just some of the best television on right now. But I love the humility. Who we have next? Judith Williams. Hi, I'm Judith Williams. And I'm the global head of diversity at Dropbox, and my job is to get more people like you into tech. Is this on? Can you guys hear me? Oh, it works. Okay. Sana. Hi, I am Sana Amanath uh, from Marvel Entertainment. I'm director of content and character development. Yeah, yeah. Um, I develop our IP across our many platforms. Most recently, co-created a character named uh, Kamala Khan, the new Ms. Marvel. It's a Muslim American superhero uh, from Jersey City. And um, also seek to find ways in which we can make uh, Marvel a more inclusive space and remind everyone that everyone can be a superhero. Hi, I'm Bob Lady. So I'm CEO of the Association of National Advertisers. Advertisers are storytellers as well. And we've got a lot of stories that we need to tell. And our mission right now, among others, is to create a strategic platform where we bring everybody together and champion multiculturalism, feminism, the kinds of things that we need within our advertising and our marketing that creates a new platform for the way that we conduct business. Hi, I'm Glenn Mazzara. I'm a TV writer, producer, showrunner. And along with Shonda, I am the uh, co-chair for the Writers Guild of America Diversity Advisory Group. OK, so now do you believe that using the word rock star for me is kind of weird when I'm on a panel with them? It's kind of odd. So 
when we talk about diversity in media, 28.3% of all speaking characters were from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, which is below the proportion of the US population. Female characters fill only 28.7% of all speaking roles, were half of the population. Um, a total of 4,200 directors were assessed for gender across all episodes of 305 scripted series and 109 motion pictures. A full 84.8% .8 of those were male and only 15% female. Across over 6,000 writers, 71% were male and 29% were female. This means for every one female screenwriter, there were 2.5 male screenwriters. In a 2013 study, the Gina Davis Institute with Dr. Stacy Smith and her team found that only 20% of employed characters in movies are female. So we just don't hold jobs. <laughs> I'm offended. Um, <laughs> and females are more likely than males to be depicted as caregivers, legal guardians, or parents. But I want to talk to Gloria first and have you tell us From a historical perspective, where have we seen the most progress for women in media? And to what can this be attributed? I, I think historically speaking, and what I'm about to say is a tribute to everybody on this panel for having broken this rule, but it is usually where there is the most individual effort and the least money. And that is required, and that is where you know, the first innovation and creativity and storytelling uh, usually comes. So there have been more poets and spoken word artists than playwrights, uh, been more rappers than uh, screenwriters. There have been more artists and street snipers than there have been cartoonists and people who whose work requires a whole uh, expensive platform. Uh, th and of course, the, uh, the whole online scene has been a game changer. But nonetheless, if you look and see who's getting paid and who isn't for writing, uh, it's not so cheerful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, the, more, the, the, the less uh, cooperation you require from the establishment, and the less money you require, that is where the innovation has come from. So, you know, what a trip and how wonderful to see uh, the, the whole uh, spoken word arts now on Broadway with Hamilton. But, yes. but, <laughs> but think of where it started. Think of where it started and look for the innovation there where there is the most freedom and the least money the innovation comes. Absolutely. One of the things, when you're talking about barrier of access, we should talk about social media. So what role, um, Imani, I'm gonna come to you with this. What have, like how have social and digital media changed the game? Uh, I think that social and digital media has changed the game entirely because it's placed the power at our fingertips. Uh, it's given us a mic and really just made having a platform accessible. Um, for for MuslimGirl.com, for example, the reason why we started doing what we're doing is because we felt that Muslim women's narratives were completely neglected from mainstream media when, for the past decade, really all the media could talk about is Muslim women and what they believe and what they represent. Um, and now we have such a presence, the, the largest presence since 9-11 of any American Muslim entity um, in mainstream media and the reason why we've even had a fighting chance is because we turned inward and started creating our own media. Mm -hmm. We created our own platforms and we did so with solely the resources that we had available to us, which was Twitter, <laughs> Facebook, mm -hmm. blogging, things that literally everyone in this room has right, right there on your phones in your pockets. And really it's just eliminated the borders. It's allowed us to access so many people that otherwise would not hear what we're trying to say. And in this day and age, you know, when you, when you speak from your phone, you could be reaching hundreds, thousands, millions of people through social media. Um, it makes it very transferable. It makes it a message that allows you to be able to connect with other people around the world in a way that 
really amplifies your voices. Um, and for me personally, I, I don't believe in being a voice for the voiceless. I think that that's really how we can appropriate and appropriate and misinterpret a lot of different narratives. Uh, I believe that it's on us, those with a voice, to empower other individuals to use their voice. Everyone has their own voice. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a right to use their voice. And it's important for us, those of us that are privileged, that do have these resources, to use those resources that we have available to us to spread that and get as many people up there as possible and really just embolden, embolden them, empower them, and amplify those voices as well. Yes. There's one question. We always hear the word diversity over and over again. What does diversity mean? Shonda, I'll have you start that. Um, no, I hate the word diversity. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it because it suggests an otherness to me. Yeah. Um, when people think about the word diversity, they use it as sort of a catch-all, as if, you know, they say, um, let's, get some, let's get a writer who's diverse, as if a person can be diverse. A person is not diverse. A group of people are diverse. A group of white women sitting in a room, they are diverse because they are all different kinds of people, not just because of the color of their skin. That's not what makes people diverse. So to me, I think diversity means having a world that looks like the actual world looks. It means having a world that looks normal. So I like to just say that we're normalizing the world as opposed to having some sort of diversity. Diversity is everybody's voice, everybody's represented, everybody who sort of stands in this world is shown and seen. Anybody else wants to take that? Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to take that. Your mic on? Yeah. Let me try this. Within advertising, uh, we don't have the level of diversity that, that we should. There is so much that's necessary to provide fairness, equality, equity. And we need as an industry, both on the entertainment side and in the marketing side, to bring that level of equity across the board. The ANA, the, the organization that I represent today, is announcing a new initiative called See Her, which we will focus our resources to be able to bring a level of equity to women in our marketplace, to accurately portray women in advertising and marketing. And with that, we aim to be able to bring that equity across the board in all of our advertising and marketing. We will know when we get there, when we have eliminated from the minds of all chief marketing officers any conscious or unconscious bias that goes into any of our advertising and marketing. So I'd like to say a lot of times when we talk about diversity, what we focus on is something called inherent diversity. And inherent diversity is, those are the things or the attributes that we are born with. But we all actually have another kind of diversity, and that's acquired diversity. So those are the things that we learn on our journey through life. And actually, when we talk about diversity, we're really talking about what makes us all distinct, what makes us all unique, what makes us all have our own stories. So we need to get away from focusing on what people look like or that inherent diversity and talk a lot more about our acquired diversity. And that brings everyone into the conversation because we all have have acquired diversity. You want to take that, Glenn? Yeah. Um, uh, in my experience in, in Hollywood, you know, I agree with what everybody's saying, and, and the way it works is diversity is kind of a, a, a racist and sexist term within itself because it implies from a white, male, able-bodied, straight perspective. Right. And, right. and that's really... And, and the way that these writers' rooms, most writers' rooms are a boys' club, and then we say, oh, we need a strong you know, female perspective, get me a woman, or we have a gay yeah, character, or, get me a gay writer, and, and that's, that's how it's been done for too long, and I think that what's been exciting about social media is that the audience rejects that. People want to see their stories told, and I think the diversity... The, is, is, is that there's an appetite that people want to see themselves reflected on screen, they want to see their stories told, and that's happening quicker than the way it's getting made. The, the, the money is still flowing to white male directors, white male writers. I benefit from this system, I'll be honest, but it's not fair and it needs to be corrected. And so that's why I'm thankful for a panel like this to, to talk about how it's actually done and what's being put out there. It, you can see these numbers have not changed in, in decades. I, 
so now I have a question for you specifically because Marvel is known for being almost revolutionary in its inclusiveness by actually telling the stories of people who are brown, who are not white, straight, male. What is Marvel prioritizing and how is Marvel making that something that's important? Well, you know, at Marvel we always say we are the world outside your window. And yeah. what works so well about our content is the, that the superhero um, identity is so much about the ideals that they represent. It's not about them being white or black or Hispanic or brown. It is about who they can become. It's about going beyond those labels of gender and racial identity and sexual orientation and trying to remind people of who they actually are and what they can potentially become. They can become, anyone can become Spider-Man. You don't have to be white Caucasian male. Oh, by the way, we just created a Latino black Spider-Man. His name yes. is Miles Morales, and he's selling lots of comics. Yes. Um, and that's sort of the way that we think about it. I think if we focus on, we need to make a black character, we need to make a brown character, I think we're limiting ourselves in the types of stories that we can tell. We need to tell unique stories about unique individuals, and then we will tell great stories. And I think that's what we do really, really well. And those are comics right now? Those are comics right now, yeah. We've got, we've got a female Thor, we've got a yes. Korean American Hulk, we've yes. got a black Captain America, and a Muslim American uh, Ms. Marvel. Um, we're changing it up and it's working. And what's really exciting is that six years ago we probably wouldn't have been able to sell those comics, but now there is this sense of desire of representation and people are being vocal about it. That's what's incredibly important is that I could walk into a room of a bunch of middle-aged white men and say, hey, by the way, I want to create this like Muslim character from Jersey City um, and I want her to don the name of Ms. Marvel. Take the company name. What do you guys think about that? And they said yes. Um, I think that just says so much about where we, we've come. We still have a lot more work to go. Um, but for me, that that just shows that we've really activated a, a sense of change and a, a change in the mindset of individuals that I think that really, really need it. They need to be conscious of the fact that we need to be, be representative. Absolutely. Gloria, so sometimes we, we can spew stats and be like, oh, this is how many more people of color. How have you seen television change over the decades? How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> How can you give it to me in three minutes? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. We have moved from the only expert weather woman being a woman dressed in a nightgown rising up from her bed in the middle of the screen and saying, it's going to be a rainy night. <laughs> you, you know, you can't make this stuff up. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and from on radio, a firm, absolutely firm conviction that people would not accept serious news in a female voice. Mm. And, you know, so it's been a long, long, long journey. Uh, and I think we are beginning, beginning at, at least to, thanks to Shonda and everybody here, <laughs> beginning to see a little bit of what the world looks like. But I think we still don't appreciate quite how crucial it is, you know, that our brains are organized on narrative. You know, we've been sitting around campfires for 100,000 years telling stories. We don't understand or really absorb facts and statistics. I mean, if you tell me a statistic, I will make up in my mind a narrative as to why it's true. It is the way we organize our thoughts and, you know, the media is the current campfire. And as long as some people are not allowed to tell their stories in this circle, uh, they will not be visible and other folks who identify with their stories will not feel that they can uh, be present. And I, I have to say, I think this also affects hard news. Because as you may notice from the words hard news and soft news, it's quite genderized, mm. all right? So hard news are facts and generalities. That's serious. Soft news is narrative. 
and that is treated with contempt, and not exactly contempt, but it's not as important, right? Uh, and th most of our serious news people, to bring the new world of news into what we're talking about, uh, are still devoted to facts and generalities. And I think that's part of the reason that we are so uh, into celebrities, because we're starved for narrative. And it's like celebrities are the only narrative in town. Mm -hmm. On, on, you know, on the, the nightly news. So I think we really need to think seriously about this and to, it needs to be absorbed into our thinking about news as well. And we need to really think about, you, you know, I got up this morning three times I heard the American people. Excuse me? You know, they're, I mean, they were incredibly diverse. We're not big, one big lump <laughs> called the American people, but we are still getting our news in a generality that I think frequently makes us feel alienated and also doesn't give us the narrative on which our human brains actually, or by which our brains are organized. Good point. Now, Amani, when we're talking about telling stories and narratives, how do we empower the people we call the voiceless. How do we share whatever our courage is to tell stories with other people who aren't as brave? I wouldn't say necessarily that they're not as brave, but I think that they might not have the opportunity to speak right. up. Uh, I think that it's really important. One of the most important things for us to do to amplify those voices is to pass the mic whenever we have it. If there's someone that can speak to a lived experience that you cannot, do not take up that space. Do not speak on their behalf. Let them speak for themselves. And I think that that also goes into what, what we just discussed regarding diversity, right? I, I don't think that we can talk about diversity without talking about representation. Um, and I don't mean visibility, but I mean representation. Because it's one thing, for example, I, just to use Marvel as an example, right? I don't know what... Well, obviously we know Sana, you're behind it, but for example, if we have a, a black character as Captain America, are the writers black people, right? Like who are the ones included in the process? I think that that's really important. Mm -hmm. When we have roles on television that are finally going to make people of color visible, are the people playing those roles actually people of color? Like just last week, trending story, right? Rumi. We're talking about making a movie about Rumi in Hollywood. Now, this is a, an iconic poet who is from modern-day Afghanistan, and the name of the actor that was suggested as the role was Leonardo DiCaprio, oh. a blonde, blue-eyed white man. But when you think about it, when we have roles in television or in Hollywood and the media that have to do with terrorists, that have to do with villains, that have to do with people that want to destroy us, that hate our freedoms. We have absolutely no problem finding brown actors to play those roles. Sure it's so important for us to remember representation in these conversations. So we were having a side conversation before this panel started. It was Shonda and Glenn, and we were talking about when you ask for actors and say, I want a judge for my show, and they show up with white men. And you said, I wanted a judge. I didn't tell you I wanted a white man judge. I wanted all people. Can you talk about the process of cutting through that to get actual representation that is actually divert well, representative of the whole world? <laughs> <laughs> the landscape of, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a, in, in the casting process of any, any shows, and Lynn can talk about this too, there is a system by which and I think this happens in business, I think this happens in any place, everything is white, straight, male, unless otherwise stated. Mm -hmm. So a judge is a white, straight man, unless you say, I want a gay judge, or a female judge, or a black judge, or an Asian judge. You have to put a qualifying word on it before they'll ever consider any other person to play that part. That is very upsetting to me, because I feel like that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I should be able to say I want a judge, and you should send me actors from between the ages of 25 and 75, or 85, or whatever, of all different abilities, of all different colors, of all different genders, of all different you know, races, religions, whatever, and it should be 
easily done and it shouldn't even be a discussion. And yet every single time you have to ask and repeat and ask and repeat. Now we've done it enough and I'm lucky enough that I have you know, enough shows that I can say, if you guys don't start sending me these people, we're gonna stop calling you. And therefore, you know, you know, money breeds power and business breeds power. We're hiring enough people, we are allowed to sort of set our own rules. But in general, if you have one show and you're trying to cast it, it is a constant process of picking up the phone and trying to force somebody to reshape their thinking. Mm. Um, and it has to be done. I mean, I, I don't think that that's something that you give up on. When you're looking for writers, when you're looking for directors, when you're looking for anybody, you're constantly picking up the phone and saying, I know I said I wanted writers, but that means that I want writers who are um, not just straight white men. I want writers who are everything. Please send me everybody. And you have to continuously do that. And Glenn, you mentioned a story that was fascinating related, related to that. Well, just, you know, it, it, I agree with Shonda. You know, this is something that needs to be done. It requires leadership. And, and the showrunner is kind of the person who's in charge of everything. And, and you really need to fight that fight. And, and, you know, very often people, you know, and, and Judith can talk about unconscious bias, but, you know, very often people have their fears, their anxieties, their preconceived notions about what the audience is gonna think or something like this. And you know, so I had a, um, I just did a show called Damien. If you blinked, you missed it, but it was, it was, it was quite good. But anyway, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, I had this, this um, African-American actress was cast and then we were casting another role and an actor came in and he was black and I liked him and put him on the list. and. And, you know, I got a call from somebody saying, well, if we have two black actors in the show, you're the black show. Oh. And, and, you know, I'll be honest, it was kind of jarring, wow. but I've, I've had some experience. So I was able to say, well, that's not appropriate. That's not how we're going to do this. And, and that person was taken out of the casting process. You know, I had, um, I'll just speak to this. I also had a, a character who was written as Lebanese. And that actor said to me, well, am I a terrorist? And I said, no, you're just a photographer. What are you talking about? <laughs> and, and he said, oh, because I only play terrorists. That's wow. the only roles that are written. So I said, well, just, don't, just take the picture. But anyway, <laughs> so, so I, I see we only have so much time. But what I want to say is I, I was very inspired by what the vice president said today. And I think that, you know, white men need to be involved in this, this discussion. You know, very often... Um, um, there's a level, there's a lack of professionalism that I find within my own industry, mm. where people do not stand up, people have these, this locker room talk, people say disparaging things about actors and writers, and we need to have some leadership. We need to have, yes, we need more people telling their stories, but right now there's, there's a hesitancy to take this on, and the way things happen is that every group blames every other group. So the Writers blame the studios and the agencies and the networks, and everybody can feel very comfortable blaming the system, and people are passing the buck and not taking their personal responsibility seriously, and they are not standing up. And that's something that I think really needs to change in Hollywood. People have to say, what is my role? What do I do? How can I fix this? And they just have to see that this is something that's really important that needs to be remedied. Absolutely. <laughs> The idea that two actors in the show being black makes it a black show, though, like, that's just, come on. It's like, this room is really black. There's three black people in it. Oh. <laughs> so, Judith, how do we enable the entertainment industry to be more conscious of unconscious bias? So the first step is education, is to understand what our unconscious biases are. And I use a pretty simple definition. Unconscious biases are the blind spots that arise because of errors in the way that we process data. So we tend to use this shorthand, and it defaults to things that we've already seen. And so one of the problems is that the media or Hollywood is actually complicit in creating images that reinforce the images that reinforce our biases. So the first thing to do is, is accept that and then to think about how do we show different images. And another interesting thing about unconscious bias is that when biases, when I am subjected to my own unconscious biases, 
I can't interrupt my own biases. And so it's really important to have someone like Glenn in the room or Shonda in the room who calls out the bias in the moment and says, no, you can just be a photographer, right? Don't fall into your bias. And we can't assume that because I'm a person of color or because I'm a woman that I don't have the same biases that everyone else does. So the first thing is to call out bias, to be accountable. The, the second thing that needs to happen is that we need to think about what are the structures that we can put in place that remove the decision. So if we think about um, one of a really great example from the media is for Samantha Bee's new show. The producer not only had blind submissions, so you didn't know the names of the writers, but she also sent out a particular format for the jokes so that experience level was actually no longer a factor because then everyone knew how to submit their contribution. So that's a really great example of interrupting all of the biases that we fall into. So thinking about those ahead of time, uh, increasing the awareness, increasing the accountability, and I think having folks like Glenn and Shonda who are in the rooms and who are reproducing themselves and the people that they choose. And I think the WGA uh, has been really instrumental in bringing that awareness. Uh, we had an unconscious bias panel. Um, the, uh, we reproduced it at the, I'm sorry, the WGA the Writers Guild of America um, and the Producers Guild of America. So the conversation has changed and there are definitely standard bearers who are consistently reminding the industry that what we've done before is not good enough. Bob, advertising has a lot of unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. What is the most pointed one that you see that's still happening even though you're trying to educate advertisers about doing better? Well, first of all, we have to recognize that we have a problem. And True. in order to First be able step. to address the problem, we have to organize ourselves to be able to deal with it. What we have done in our industry is we have created a separate organization called the Alliance for Family Entertainment. In its earliest generation, it was to be able to work with content providers to create all family programming that was missing from our, uh, all of our programming uh, schedules. In its current generation, it has been focusing in and will continue to focus in on women. And this new See Her initiative is going to focus in on creating processes by which marketers themselves can assess the unconscious bias in their ads. And we intend to give them the toolkits and the resources necessary to be able to gauge whether those unconscious bias exist. The second thing we have to do is we have to go back to our roots and work with the with the entertainment industry to create the content and to attempt to influence them to ensure that we're working with a level playing field so that women are accurately portrayed both in the content as well as the ad so that they can do both simultaneously. And then third, we have to educate our industry to be able to leverage their advertising buying power to ensure that their investment behind supporting the programs that they have are in such a state that we can, in fact, portray women the way they should be portrayed. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, Shonda, I wanna go back to you. In terms of when people talk to you about what you do is revolutionary, what is your response? Um, I, I have a real problem with that concept of it being revolutionary because it's just, I, make the world look like the world looks. I don't understand why it's revolutionary to portray yourself accurately. This I panel think. exists, <laughs> this panel exists because it's revolutionary. It's because the rest of the world is not even doing the work enough, which is why yours stands out. And I saw your glass ceiling piece. But what do we need to be doing now to where in two years, we no longer consider your work revolutionary? <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a couple of things. I mean, I feel like within the industry that we're in, there is a, a responsibility to always sort of be holding the door open behind you. Um, I'm trying to do my part to sort of raise the next generation of female showrunners um, and showrunners of color and helping writers get voices. My writers' rooms are more, um, I guess, normal looking than most writers' rooms just because I try to hire everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and make it that way. But I also feel like if you're not in a world where there is just a ton of diversity happening for you and you're not in a room in which 
you know, and you're trying to make that happen for your workplace or you're trying to make that happen, the thing to remember is that the best thing you can do is to not make somebody the only one in the room. Mm -hmm. if, you are, if you are not the only person of color in the room or the only woman in the room, you have somebody else to look at and go, we don't think that makes any sense, so that there's somebody else to speak with you. If not, you're the only voice, and everybody looks at you and goes, that person's weird and wrong, and then you're sort of ejected. That's what happens in a writer's room anyway, and I assume that's what happens in a lot of business situations. And she's saying yes, because she's the expert. <laughs> <laughs> that's my suggestion, is to really try to keep that happening. So now, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so many thoughts. I've been nodding along, because <laughs> I agree with everything everyone is saying. Um, you know, it's interesting because I grew up wanting to be white. Um, I looked at the images around me and I actually related to just white, blonde, beautiful women. Um, and it wasn't until I started becoming very strong in my own identity I realized that I was actually rejecting a part of myself. And the media was telling me to reject myself. And that was so hard to, to overcome. And what we don't realize is that we're actually advancing that the sort of the, the, what the corporations have expected because we're buying into that. We're buying into that paradigm, the sort of white paradigm, because that's sort of all was, that was offered to us. And I think what's happening now is really comes down to really just practical good business. Um, if we're creating that content, that is representative, if we have those voices out there who are creating those unique stories, who have these distinct experiences, now we're creating more product and more content for people who are gonna go out and buy that, and that's what's changing. I think people were afraid because people like me were buying the white Barbie doll. Mm. And yes, I did not have the brown Barbie doll to play with, but now that I am seeing the brown Barbie doll, the brown superhero, the brown characters, I'm sort of empowered in my own self to continue to support and buy that content. There's this, this activation happening across our audiences, which I think is extremely exciting. And that's going to relate to the corporation saying, if we ignore this entire population, we're gonna lose money. Mm -hmm. And they, they should, they should create those opportunities. Um, and it is, it's up to the people up here. It's, it's up to us to have that intentionality, to look at who we are hiring and how we can be a bit more proactive. And it's me being a pain in the butt, an eloquent pain in the butt <laughs> to my superiors and they, in, and they will be a pain in the butt to their superiors. I think that's how that kind of change and progress will happen, is sort of the, the activation of that sort of mindset. We, we were also saying that, that the media has real impact on the professional sphere. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the Grey's Anatomy effect and how yep. that's changed women going into surgery, which I think is pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah we were talking about, there's, there's a huge, and it, to me this is the craziest and the best thing ever about what I've get to do for a living is I am a fake person, fake writer who makes up fake surgeries and pretends <laughs> that I do them. And now there are, we're on our fourth graduating class of doctors getting out of medical school, of actual girls who went to medical school because they watched Grey's Anatomy and loved it. Like, yep. and, four, <laughs> and our first, it's, it's 12 years in, so it's our first class of real women who became, who are done with all of their fellowships and everything and they're actually surgeons now. And I keep meeting these women, and it's incredible to me that they became scientists because I typed interior OR day one day and thought that was cool. <laughs> uh, but there's a real responsibility there. And you know, to, to know that you are affecting people that way, you have a responsibility to make that happen once you know that you can do it. Incredible. So we're gonna do one more question just down the line. If there's one thing you want people to take away from today, walking away with, about media, the next steps, what they need to be doing, what would that be? So I want to offer the inverse of Shonda, what you were just talking about. So these women of color were empowered by, say, by seeing people that looked like them in very incredible and diverse careers, right? Imagine what impact media has on people like me, Muslim women, okay? when the only images that we see of ourselves on television are 
as women that are oppressed, mm -hmm. women that are voiceless, women that are rape victims, mm -hmm. women that are victims who need other people to step in on their behalf. Imagine what that does to us, not only to us, but also to the society in which we live yeah. and the repercussions that we have to face on a day-to-day -day basis. The way people treat us, the risk that we put ourselves in the moment we step out of our homes. I think this is a brilliant example of how media does transcend reality. It really reflects in the way that we treat each other, the way that we treat ourselves, the way we even view ourselves. So what I would want people in this room to take away is just like we support media that is diverse, we support media that, looks, that has people that look like us, we make sure we give them views, 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 we make sure that we send in letters supporting them, praising them. When you see wrongful depictions of people that might not necessarily look like you on television, don't support it. Yes. Don't watch it. <laughs> Tweet that out, make hashtags, make your voice be heard, speak out against it. That's the only way. When we show these directors, these producers that we, this is not gonna fly under our watch, that's the only way we can change that representation in the media, in Hollywood, and it's going to have an impact on our society as a whole. Can I, can I also suggest that the, the other great way to make that happen is to not watch it, not spend your don't money on it, because mm -hmm. honestly, economics speak louder than anything else. People will make what people will buy. They mm -hmm. don't care what the garbage is, they will make it. So if you don't watch it, you don't spend your money on it, they will stop making it. Yeah. Oh, Judith. <laughs> yes. And uh, try to find a way to be an advocate for people who are not like you. Speak up for individuals that are, you know, have a different look, have a different experience, have a different background. Think about the intersectionality. If we think about what happened in Orlando, this was an attack on the LGBTQ community, it yep. was an attack on the Latinx community, it was an attack on communities of color, right? That there is this intersectionality and that we all need to be speaking up for one another. So it's not enough to say, hey, I didn't like those images of women. Think about the images of all of us and make sure that we're calling for that type of representation across the board. And, and I think it's also, you know, to sort of, to what Amani was saying, sort of don't support the things that you don't believe in, the negative perceptions of individuals that are put out there in the media. On the opposite end, advocate what is working. Advocate the positive representation by a bunch of Ms. Marvel comics. <laughs> Not because I work on it, but also kind of because of that. But, um, uh, you ha we have to, that's how we show our voice. That's how we show our buying power. That's how actual change is going to happen. We had a Cap Captain, Mar Captain Marvel used to wear uh, thigh-high boots and a bathing suit, and we changed it four years ago, and we gave her a fighter pilot uniform. She's strong and beautiful and empowered, but she's not sexualized. And that... <laughs> That's going to become a movie. That's going to become a movie in four years. It's our first female-led superhero movie that Marvel has done. That's incredible. In four years that happened. And that's because people came out in droves supporting it and buying the content. That's what we need. We need you guys to be aware and awake and to promote. Word. I'll keep it simple and short. You've got to fight for change. We are all here today to fight for the change that is necessary to be able to move this country in a different direction. Use your voices, use your pocketbooks, use whatever is necessary to make change happen. Yeah, and I, and I think we have to use our voice and we have to listen to each other. You know, this is a complex topic. You know, issues of race and gender in this country are, are very complex. They're complex all, all over the world. They, we all bring a lot of baggage to that. And I think, you know, part of the issue is that there's a, a power structure that has not been listening, and people are using their voice, and they're starting to, to hear that. And I think that's how change comes. It's from continued dialogue. If there was one magic answer, we hopefully would have found it by now. We haven't. So it's, it's got to do with advertising and comic books and unconscious bias and everything you're seeing here and Shonda shows and, and blogs and all of that. It's, it's, it's going to take a long time. I don't know if it gets done in two years. I wish it did. But it's a cultural thing and, and, and we have to keep at it every single day. And it's a lot of 
little personal conversations back and forth, face to face, and that's what I find has been helpful. And, and people go, oh, I never thought about that. Oh, you're right, I'm wrong, da da da. And that's how I think we've been able to make some change. So thank you for using your voice for change and using your power for change. And I am so excited that we had to have, you know, we had this panel. Thank our panelists with a round of applause. And have a nice evening.